so naval warfare people would uh, the tactics was two ships would come close to each other pirates would uh, try and loot ships right so yeah. come close to each other and then the tactics was grapple and board so you have to jump over to the ship and then you're fighting with knives yeah. right the invention of the cannon changed everything mm. and it triggered an arms race why because imagine your cannon can fire 1% longer has a 1% longer range than my mm. cannon mm. but that 1% advantage is a 100% win rate guaranteed because you are out of range but you Correct. hit all 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 other ships right so right. there is just you just need to continuously invest in trying out different variables what's predictive trying some experiments trying ab tests seeing how can you lower friction but also get incremental cr- predictive power to be able to weed out the bads uh, which is the customers who will not pay you back and accept as many uh, goods as possible so, Awesome, we're live with yet another edition on our CPO series. Today, we're very, very happy to be joined by Ashwin Shekhar, who is currently the Chief Product and Technical Officer at Incred Financial Services. He is an alumni of IIT Madras. He's been in this space for over 17 years, developing, managing, and launching some amazing products that we're going to be chatting about more today. And especially if you are a fintech enthusiast, I can assure you uh, this one's going to be really interesting for you. Uh, he's also very, very passionate about sustainable living, um, done a bunch of things at the grassroots level. Uh, so if you are interested, I know all of us lead very busy lives, but if you are interested on how you can make a small, small dent but just by just your contribution, uh, stay tuned. We are going to be covering some really practical ways you can implement this in your daily lives. But to kickstart, Ashwin, first of all, welcome to this pod. Uh, super excited to chat with you today. Thank you, Sohas, and thanks to the product folks for having me. Really appreciate it. Awesome, awesome. Um, Ashwin, we're going to kick this off on a little bit of a light note. Uh, on the Incred website, we noticed Rahul Dravid is your brand ambassador. We're all huge fans. So just very, very curious to know, have you ever gotten a chance to meet him? And if yes, what is the experience like? Yes, yes. Uh, so I have met him twice, actually. Uh, okay. So I'm a huge Rahul Dravid fan, probably dating myself, but... I have seen his debut innings in Lords. I don't know if you guys were even born back then, but 1996 at Lords, he scored 95. And so since then, I have been a fan. So in 2011, I actually saw him score a century at Lords. Uh, I was there at Lords, so that was a fun experience. Uh, got to shook, shake his hands, and that was amazing. One thing I noticed is he has a very firm handshake. Uh, okay. And then with Incred, uh, yeah. because he's a brand ambassador, he we got an opportunity to, he did a coaching clinic. Uh, I think it was called Super Over with Rahul Dravid. And it was amazing. Three hours where one hour was people could ask him questions. There were about 25, 30 people who got the chance. And uh, after that, for two hours, he was doing a coaching clinic in his uh, Rahul Dravid and Prakash Padukon performance center outskirts of Bangalore. Oh, no. And so, yeah, I mean, I was batting. He said good stance. So that was like amazing. <laughs> And then, wow, I'm a uh, huge, huge fan. So super jealous of you. But uh, Ashwin, was this like a perk of working at Incred that you get to meet Rahul Dravid? Yeah, the best best day of my life. So, <laughs> and, and my my colleague, he he was bowling, and Rahul Dravid kind of touched him and corrected his stance. Oh. And he was threatening not to shower, saying, "I have uh, Rahul Dravid's DNA on me now." <laughs> oh. Wow. Yeah, that was, that was <laughs> Even even I've played cricket for like over a decade of my life, trying to get into like the Ranji side. That didn't happen, but mm-hmm. huge, huge Rahul Dravid fan. Like growing up in Karnataka, I think he is an idol for a lot of us. So yeah, that is absolutely. amazing. Uh, since you're also passionate about cricket, are you following the IPL? Uh, any favorites on who's going to make it to the final this year? I mean, uh, I was living in Chennai for so long and I'm a big Dhoni fan as well. So I'm hoping CSK and Rajasthan Royals. Rajasthan Royals because of the Dravid connection and then CSK oh, nice. because of Dhoni. Probably his last season, right? So nice. let's see if nice. that happens. Awesome routing. I think let's see if CSK RR comes to the finals. Then we'll hopefully catch the game together. And uh, let's hope. I think the game's going to be... It's not going to be in Chennai, right? I think the finals in Ahmedabad or 
Bombay. Finals in Ahmedabad. Yeah. Ahmedabad. Yeah. Five Sixers was nice as well. So Rinku. Yeah. No, that's awesome. But uh, jumping right into the meat, I think this is super fun to kick this part off. But um, like we mentioned earlier, I think you've had some extensive experience uh, over a decade and a half. Um, now, especially you know, very very deep on the fintech side. Before I go deeper into the fintech side of things, one thing I'd love to know is, um, as your role as a chief product officer today, uh, most of your time I think would be spent on one figuring out, okay, hey, are we on the right track as a product company? And two, how do I get the best people to build our stuff here? Right? Um, let's take the second point first. Uh, while identifying and building strong teams, uh, what are some attributes or qualities that you've you know framed in your mind? In your mind, especially while hiring these folks, on you know these are the qualities that are necessary to become a part of a very high-performing product team. Sure, uh, really good question. I mean, at the junior level, I mean, so you're right. A lot of my job. is to hire the right people and then kind of set up the ecosystem where uh, they are not getting blocked and and they are able to execute they are able to kind of uh, express themselves uh, so hiring really good people and and then allowing them to uh, empowering them allowing them to kind of um, run run with it is 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 exactly what we are trying to trying to do and that's a large part of my job with respect to skills which we are looking for um on the for I'm, and of course i'm not going to talk about hard skills you your question said what is the top 1% um i mean if you want to distill it down very very simply there are two things which i'm looking for one is kind of uh, intellectual curiosity uh, are you curious do you ask questions do you uh in in general are you able to display kind of intellectual curiosity there are multiple ways in which you can uh find out right when you're having a conversation is this individual is curious and the second is uh grit and perseverance uh, you will inevitably run into difficulties run into challenges do you give up in at the first sign of trouble or do you have the grit to kind of keep going find ways to overcome it uh showcase the ownership and high agency to keep going and deliver results so at, i mean fundamentally those are the two things uh, we are looking for nice of course experience is useful but i do think kind of especially in product it is overrated uh, you want generic product skills uh, customer obsession uh, empathy for the customer all all those pieces but a lot of these skills are transferable across across domains having some domain knowledge does help it kind of helps you hit the road running but uh, we are primarily looking for kind of um, intellectual curiosity and uh, grit but nice. if you want to go deeper i can i can kind of double click into some of the other things uh, actually yes i I'd, i'd love to double click on this one and um, specifically on um, you mentioned grit perseverance intellectual curiosity right uh when you are interviewing somebody right from the resume stage to having those conversations with them are there any particular ways you found to gauge intellectual interest or you know perseverance grit is it you know some stories from the past work they've done or anything i'd love for you to you know double click on that stage yeah sure um i mean i do have a standard set of questions so what we do is called a full interview loop ah. uh so different product managers are assigned Uh, to look for different attributes so first there is a screening round and and then there is a full loop uh, typically for junior pms apms there will be three rounds um so someone is looking for kind of product insight uh, ability to kind of uh, have you been curious about why is a product successful or why is a product fail or do you have some in, any interest outside of work um like one one candidate i interviewed we spoke a lot about kind of inline uh, petrol engines versus which are arranged in a v what is the ad- advantages disadvantages one other interview was very interesting we spoke about james webb space telescope you are essentially looking for some evidence that people are interested they're curious they dive uh, dive deep and they are willing to research topics and learn about stuff um, and then the other one of my more favorite questions is uh, uh, tell me about something you did 
uh, which which you think you're most proud of right mm. and that question then forces people to kind of talk about their absolute best work if if they have a little bit of experience and then inevitably i'll double click into okay tell me when you ran into challenges or you disagreed with some colleague or someone said no we should not be doing this what did you do uh, how did you persevere some i mean there are just different ways of asking the same question but you want to see some evidence that uh, people we will have the stick with itness to stick with the problem and and to iterate until uh, you can actually deliver results until you're successful Nice. No, thanks for sharing that. I think uh, that was really, really useful to kick this off. Um, Ashwin, slightly changing tracks. One going deeper into your particular product career. Uh, you stuck around at Gain Credit for over thirteen years. I think closer to fourteen years, which is an anomaly or an outlier in today's world. Especially uh, if you were to ask me, um, I'd see that maybe in one in every hundred, one in every thousand profiles, right? um and i think uh, one thing i'd love to learn is um, was this a conscious choice to you know stick around were you really having super, like lots of fun um but if you can walk us through those years um especially in an era where people jump roles in every 2 3 years uh, what really prompted you to stay along stick along for that long and um, is there any advice for you know other people in today's market to pick up from here sure so um, i mean i started off as an analyst i was recruited straight out of college uh, and i was recruited by this gentleman krishna gopinathan he is an indian american and he is the primary patent holder for a product called falcon which is the fraud detection uh, software it's a neural net based software which if you ever swipe the credit card and have you gotten a call from a bank saying hey was this you who swiped this card uh, yeah. that is falcon working the background to prevent fraud and so i started off building uh, models before it was called machine learning models we were building uh, models applying it for the subprime lending space and we were essentially an analytics services shop and um, was this was this during the subprime crisis because i think you started around that time right? 2006 to 2007 yes yes so this was just before but we so we built some models which were predictive models which was made the portfolio in the us super profitable we were the most profitable subprime lender of its class we were providing analytic services uh, to these lenders there and i was then in 2008 going to leave uh, gain credit I was going to go to i am to do my mba but krishna then convinced me saying hey you just kind of sold the portfolio before the subprime crisis uh, we've made a bunch of money and why didn't you go to the uk and you will be our single person on the ground launching our lending business lending is super profitable so let's get into lending ourselves and we will control the we will we'll have the full um access to full profit across the value chain as opposed to just providing analytic services so he convinced me that uh, launching a business will be the best real life mba i can get so i went off to london and i was living there for 3 and 1/2 years i was the lone employee and kind of launched uh, our lending business in the uk and that was a super learning experience right as in there is this is not we it was not called product management at the time he used to call me i want a single throat i can catch if there is execution is uh, altering so in effect it was called it was product management but without the title yeah and and that is a fun experience we scaled it from 0 to 150 million dollar business and uh, negotiating with vendors there we did not have a loan management system so found a loan management system we had engineers back in chennai uh, kind of we did not know how to build a website a lot of things which you don't know and uh, you figure it out right you um, you face one problem after another and then if you can consistently solve one after another getting out problems and you're kind of gathering momentum and, and moving forward so that was uh, that was a super fun experience and then kind of just i kind of prioritized learning and a variety of uh, experiences i have run operations i we had a 150 fte call center uh, which i was running at one point in time i was running a managing a 100 million pound collections portfolio uh, 
and, and then kind of formally launched product management at, at Gain Credit. Before, I mean, this product management, 2006, there are no product management jobs in India, I think. I mean, the title wasn't available. So just, I think the fun part which kept me at Gain Credit was just a variety of experiences and a lot of ownership given very early. Versus thinking about, okay, do you have the experience, et cetera. I think the prioritization was, okay, this guy shows evidence of being able to execute. So just keep giving him more until until he breaks and then we can help him. Uh, and I think that served me well. And the other thing that kept me there was we kind of become like family uh, over time and uh, learned a lot. We got very, very close to a lot of people and uh, a lot of people whom I hold very close to my heart. There are pitfalls to being like family. Uh, and I see, I, I've learned the difference at Incred versus uh, Gain Credit. Incred is much more of a team sport. Uh, and, and it's about uh, winning uh, as a culture. And there, I think, uh, so that, I mean, just, just the opportunity to work with people whom I liked and a variety of experiences and succeeding delivering results doing some fun stuff um kind of kept me there sorry if that was a long winded answer but yeah no no it helps us understand that and is that uh something if you got a chance to do this all over again in 2006 to now is that something that you would do or would you suggest like um if, I'm, I'm just trying to you know help others uh, gain a perspective here uh, the advantages of compounding, right? When you stay for so yeah. many years at a company, you get that advantage. But there are advantages sometimes of, you know, getting different experiences from different companies. Yeah. Uh, no one right way to do it. But uh, if you could walk us through, if we were to look at different perspective, what are some advantages? Um, would you do something differently? Yeah, I mean, you're right. You kind of hit the nail on the head. There are advantages, pros and cons to doing both. Uh, but for me, what I've realized, and I've seen colleagues who have jumped around every two years, um, even at Gain Credit, kind of the grass always looks greener on the other side. Uh, and but what I found for myself was, as you stay on longer, I mean, I mean, prioritize the joy of working, prioritize learning. But there is a hidden asymmetry. You're building trust in the system. You know how to navigate the system. Uh, you know how to get stuff done. So you're building a reputation and that compounds. And at the right place, uh, I think there is a lot of value in uh, kind of sticking around because trust in you is compounding and that exposes you to opportunities which might otherwise not be available. I mean, just imagine in 2009, uh, 2008 rather, I am being asked to go and uh, launch a business in the UK. And in, in two years time, like I, were, I was happy kind of just uh, writing code and uh, uh, kind of building predictive models, uh, right? And, and then I got the same opportunity over and over again. Uh, after one business had scaled, I was asked to launch another product, there were some insights, etc. So just your ability to communicate, ability to influence very senior stakeholders also grows. You build relationships in that ecosystem and all of that compounds. And I have seen the pros and cons and I've seen colleagues who have kind of jumped around and moved to very big companies and then kind of you're a cog in the wheel. It's hard to kind of build a reputation, develop visibility, uh, etc. So then that leads them to jump again. And you're kind of in this caught in this trap now where um, you, your pay is probably going up, your compensation is probably going up, but um, are you getting disproportionate rewards? For the time spent, probably not because you have not built enough trust in the system. Maybe you you jump for twenty percent, twenty five percent every time, but um, sticking around. I mean, it's it's a contrarian approach, right? So you have to do what is what is right. And at that time, it felt right. Uh, and I think it is analogous to consistency is better than intensity. Uh, being patient works. People these days want instant gratification with reduced attention span. Anything doing anything worthwhile takes time. Uh, yeah. So being consistent and consistently avoiding stupidity uh, leads to great results over versus kind of bright shiny object syndrome, right? Every few months, every few years, 
oh, let, let me change things up. And, and I see a lot of people uh, fall prey to that. But there's no right or wrong. I would say, gain credit, I probably stuck around for one or two years more than I should have. Uh, <laughs> at the end, I was kind of doing a lot more work with the regulator versus doing original product innovation. And that had become kind of yeah. quite frustrating. <laughs> Life, life of a fintech professional, right? I think whenever you get into fintech, regulation is part and parcel of the game. How did the opportunity with Incred come through? Then like how, whenever you were looking to move on, uh, what were your thoughts at that time? So I, I mean, I had moved to Bangalore. I had married. Uh, my, my wife is from Bangalore. So I'd, otherwise, I was in Chennai and London. I was kind of spending time uh, back and forth. I had moved to Bangalore and I was kind of getting uh, a little sick of the travel plus spending way too much time with the regulator. So I was looking for kind of changing an ecosystem. I'd spent a lot of time in the US and UK. So, and uh, with with India stack, I was beginning to hear a lot about, a lot of the cool stuff going on in India. So I was specifically looking to get into the India ecosystem. And uh, Incred called and one thing led to another. And uh, it's been amazing journey. It's been an amazing yeah. journey. Also, can we safely agree Bangalore is the best among the three cities, or do you have other thoughts? No, I, I love I love Chennai. I've stayed there for seven yeah, years. I that. so, yeah, that's a that's a that's a derby that we usually have, right? Bangalore Chennai derby. But yeah. um, one thing um, would love to go deeper into also is um, fintech has been hot for a decade, but it's hotter than ever today. Um, you worked across both India and UK, and especially lending, like you mentioned. Uh, lending is one place where a lot of companies, uh, lending is a business model for a lot of companies who haven't figured out their business models yet. Uh, what are some interesting insights you found along the way? It's been a good decade and a half here, uh, especially covering markets, right? Uh, do you see India as an emerging market? Do you see UK as a more mature market? Uh, what are some opportunities that you see now that you're with Incred growing really, really fast there as well? Um, Anything that you'd like to share on the outlook for 2023-2024? Yeah, I mean, India has still just got a long way to grow in terms of financial inclusion. Uh, the amount of credit available uh, to people is the penetration, credit penetration is far, far lower than in the UK, than in the US. Uh, just the number of credit cards we have is, is much, much, much smaller. So a very credit deprived country and banks historically have had very simplistic uh, credit assessment models and they have been willing to only lend big ticket uh, loans and fairly simplistic kind of assessment criteria right so that's what allows fintechs and nbfc's the right to operate going into niches which the banks haven't gone into uh, or haven't been able to etc so there is just lots of opportunity both in the msme lending space as well as the consumer lending to build very, very large lending books and uh, kind of succeed. But, so yeah, I mean, I think this is kind of a one in a lifetime opportunity. And uh, just every, every, every research survey that comes out every year written by different banks, uh, by the RBI, everything points to kind of just um, all the stars are aligned and if people execute well, I think we have an opportunity to grow very large businesses and also kind of uh, serve the nation, help help people get access to credit uh, in return, kind of build their businesses, uh, get opportunities to pick up skills via, via productive loans and kind of earn their, uh, increase their income, uh, etc. So huge, uh, huge difference. I mean, huge opportunity in India. Compared to UK versus India, I mean, yeah, there are a lot of very India-centric problems which you have to solve for. Mm -hmm. um, lot of people still have, I mean, India low trust society, so people are wary of kind of of getting defrauded. Uh, they also struggle with, uh, I mean, historically there have been lots of journeys where there have been a lot of manual checks because people are afraid of uh, systematic fraud lenders. Uh, I mean. Uh, so the challenge is how can we build more checks so that we are able to lend profitably, but in a manner which is a simplistic, intuitive user experience for customers, where most of these checks get backgrounded. Right now, they're all you have to jump through these hoops, and it's confusing for people. 
uh, we we see evidence a lot of customers struggle to give uh, permission on on the android app yeah. to allow camera to take a selfie etc they get stuck for a long time uh, so india has very assisted journey we we have tele sales folks uh, calling and helping people out as well but uh, over time i think more and more innovation on ui and ux will emerge uh, to try and improve conversion because lesser friction equal to better conversion and uh, hopefully more more innovation to build trust increase trust right now people rely a lot on physical presence you want the brand to be there in the city uh, they rely on someone uh, comforting them by calling them and and speaking and explaining the product to them etc so as a consequence incred has like uh, offices in over 40 cities in oh wow right? so okay. because of kind of low trust and and you need You, people want that comfort and touch uh, but to truly solve for credit and and to democratize it we will need to do a lot of work on you know building the trust digitally what is the digital equivalent of the offline branch of of the of of the telecaller calling and explaining the product how can you do it seamlessly in a manner and while reducing the number of hoops people have to jump through so a lot, lot of lot of innovation lots of fun stuff happening good do you think that's a generational thing do you think it will still take time uh, maybe you know the, the market that we're targeting today is used to offline used to trust there but uh, the next few generations have come up digitally right today if you see the younger kids they are mobile first um, they learn they own they sleep they eat on their on the internet right so yes. uh, do you think it is a matter of time more than anything yes yes i think it is a matter of time uh and the digital natives the the segment the cohort you are referring to i think those guys don't those those folks don't have trouble uh our customer segments i think they're also kind of slightly on the uh older, older. side not in the 18 to 30 group probably right. like five plus they tend to struggle but i think uh with india stack phone pay google pay all these everyone is getting trained on, on intuitive ux is right and uh, if we can all kind of mimic a lot of what they are learning and yeah. apply the same ux journeys make it intuitive i think that will all uh, help exactly sure. exactly are there some specific opportunities you are excited about like you mentioned in today's world um india definitely you know low trust is a problem um, but on the other hand you also see so many fintech startups right you name a space and there'll be five people trying to solve it today Uh, do you still see some problems that are relatively untapped that you are excited maybe top 3 problems that you think you know are relatively still very much open yeah i mean so definitely there are we partner a lot with actually with fintechs and okay. we extend our uh, balance sheet help them lend in different niches so i think there are lots of interesting models for sure which are coming up uh, but thematically both consumer lending as well as msme lending there's just huge opportunities uh, i would say some specific untapped segments would be much more uh, fine grained use case based lending um, so we have we are now partnering with kind of large consumer marketplaces uh, to lend to let's say the sellers on amazon or what sellers is. on flipkart and, and so on so and we are now utilizing um, traditionally they don't have good credit scores or they've struggled right. to get loans from traditional avenues so we are now utilizing kind of what is the cash flows that they are generating that on those platforms for yeah. that data is yeah. uh, so i think more and more of that will grow i think that's a big opportunity as uh, electric vehicles takes over uh, much more infrastructure gets built nice. so i think there will be ev based financing there are some startups doing some interesting things there Sweet. so use case driven opportunities will come in and and then opportunity to kind of embed yourself into a, into that journey uh, will become more and more prevalent i would say nice do you also see some downside to lending like every startup i, see, I mean not every like that would be an exaggeration but a lot of consumer startups who have distribution one thing that we see they might be solving a problem in a specific space right? it could be mobility it could be um, anywhere where they get consumer distribution one feature that we see coming in is lending in some form or the other right is there any downside to this or do you see that 
as a profitable business, whatever you do, is there any um, thing that you've learned over you know these many years that hey maybe underwriting needs to be really really strong? It looks really easy from the outside, but there is a certain risk there. Is there anything that you've learned over time? There? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I think I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. Mm-hmm. All consumer platforms they have uh, very sticky use cases which keeps customers coming back again and again. Whether it's mobility or e-commerce or food commerce, etc. But that core business does not have great unit economics, right? Uh, yeah. Negative economics. So it's not surprising everyone trying to get into lending. Yeah. Uh, but lending is hard to do well. There are lots of moving parts. It's not just optimizing for user experience. Removing some check upfront can affect your risk at the at, at the back end or affect your ability to collect on on, on debt at the back end. So. I have seen uh, very, very toxic uh, performance when people have tried to optimize for one dimension. So it's this is the one business where uh, you have to eliminate people, right? As opposed to onboarding as many people as, as you can. Right. Uh, and if you don't do it well, very quickly you can lose your lose your shirts. I have seen this in the US. I have seen this in the UK. And I. I, I expect to see this in India as well, and I think already playing out for uh, for for some. Uh, Got it. That would mean NPAs would be higher than what yeah. they can manage, right? Yeah, I mean, so think about it, right? You lend hundred rupees, yeah. you're lending at two percent. For every customer who goes bad, where you lost hundred rupees of your principal, you yeah. now need fifty other exactly. good customers to make up yeah. for the loss of one one bad. So every Correct. one NPA. Hurts a lot, so risk control is is the game. Uh, so. Got it. And uh, in yours specifically, as part of Incar, is it? Um, I'd love to hear this. I think we hear so much about machine learning, AI, and you know these technologies picking up so far from outside. Um, on the practical side, have you seen a lot of these applications now start coming into solving some of these problems? Yeah, we we use multiple ML based scorecards. And uh, that that has helped us. I mean, we have delivered kind of uh, better performance than our peers. In, in terms okay. of, so I think there is a lot of investment in uh, continuous improvement. Um, there, right? I mean, so I don't know if you know of this this guy Frank Rotman. He is mm-hmm. Capital One, and he is now a VC at uh, QED. So he yeah. told me the story. Uh, right. So um, back in the day, in the 1600s. So naval warfare, people would. Uh, the tactics was two ships would come close to each other. Pirates would uh, try and loot ships, right? So uh-huh. they'd come close to each other, and then the tactics was grapple and board. So you have to jump over to the ship, and then you're fighting with knives, uh-huh. right? The invention of the cannon changed everything, mm. and it triggered an arms race. Why? Because imagine your cannon can fire one percent longer, has a one percent longer range than my mm. cannon. Mm. But that one percent advantage is a hundred percent win rate, guaranteed, because you are out of range. But you Correct. hit all 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 other ships, right? So right. there is just you just need to continuously invest in trying out different variables, what's predictive, trying some experiments, trying A/B tests, seeing how can you lower friction, but also get incremental cr- predictive power to be able to weed out the bads, uh, which is the customers who will not pay you back, and accept as many. Uh, Goods as possible. So, it's this is every lender is continuously uh, investing in models in any tactic which can help you give get a small advantage because that's a huge uh, advantage. And then that translates into you can get better customers. Imagine you can price it better. Your losses are lower. You can price it better in the front end. You're attracting better customers to come to you versus go to the competition. So all sorts of advantages become possible are enabled by you. Being able to have good risk control. Nice. Does, nice. does it make sense? Yeah. No. Absolutely. I think that's interesting. Um, Ashwin, quickly now shifting tracks. We've spoken a lot about your professional journey. We've spoken a lot about fintech in India and UK, but we'd love to get to know you a little better on the professional side now. Uh, this section that we have coming up next is lifestyle and happiness. um especially for product managers like in in your case um very very senior um well, first up i think um today's market is a little different um there are lots of folks looking out for different opportunities um 
and product management in general is seem to be a dream career for a lot of people um given where we are at today and especially for folks looking out for new roles uh, are there any tips or advices that you would like to share with them on what they should keep in mind before jumping their next role uh, before jumping the next ship um i would say um yes i mean product management is a lot of fun because uh, it puts you at the center of the company you have to interact with all the departments and then work with engineering to kind of uh, build out what uh, build out features build out products which will then get adoption which will uh, help the company meet its goals etc and you're obviously solving real customer problems um what i would say is be come into the profession for the right reasons you should uh, have thick skin you should uh, have a high tolerance for ambiguity you should uh, uh be willing to write a lot writing is a superpower uh you should be willing to be misunderstood you should um you you will get brickbats from engineers you'll get brickbats from business so have thick skin and be willing to kind of listen with empathy listen with compassion and uh, always be the customer champion so it's a lot of fun but if you are uncomfortable with ambiguity uncomfortable with an unstructured environment uh, if you are uncomfortable about kind of thinking about people's incentives simulating okay if i do this what what will other what will the customers react what will our internal customers react etc uh, then uh, think think about what's what's right for you i think there is a little bit of introspection what makes you tick uh, does in, does interacting with lots of people listening to lots of opinions uh, having to make trade offs um, having no right one right answer does it all excite you does it make you feel comfortable excited to come to work or uh does it scare you does that make you uncomfortable so i think there is a little bit of uh introspection that's needed before people kind of think about okay this is what is for me um and uh the one other thing i would say is product managers i think uh while interviewing i mean what are we looking for we are looking for people who can be thoughtful who can think carefully who can research the market who can be customer obsessed and who can then kind of uh write down what we should build and why articulate the what and the why right um versus who are great at kind of giving uh, right answers off the bat uh, real time answers uh, product manager is paid to think well so uh, that that is what we are looking for and uh, um so yeah i think i, I don't know if that answer is your question so yeah, there's no that is, yeah. no absolutely i think from the professional side for people looking at for the next role i think these are great points to keep in mind um ashwin another point that i think why we were researching more about this part and for folks we spoke to they mentioned that you were somehow able to manage your work life in a great way uh, you were for 10 to 12 hours a day you're into fitness and running uh you spend lots of time with family and you know you do a lot of things in the community for sustainability to help the planet um so question they and we both had for you was what is the secret to having 48 hours a day now yeah, my my wife and my parents will disagree about me spending time <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> uh i mean this is this is definitely a problem right i mean everyone has 24 hours that is the scarce resource so i have had i have tried lots of things uh i think now what i do works for me and let let me share that right so i used to maintain to do lists uh and every day i would go to bed saying okay look i had this to do list of 15 things but i did only five or i did only six and would go to bed unhappy about uh where i was what i was able to what i wanted to do versus what i was able to do and then um i heard this podcast uh i don't know if you follow shane parish yeah uh, parnam street founder yeah the knowledge project yeah and he and i forgotten the name of the guest he had and they were talking about this exact challenge right and um 
anyway, the, the, the short answer was throw away to-do lists, mm. calendarize everything. So mm. right now my measure of success is, hey, if I have said nine to 10, I'm going to do this. Did I do it or not? And that's nice. instant feedback. And B, it forces prioritization in itself because there is only 24 hours in a day. So you have to put in into the calendar yeah. what you want to do at that time. And nice. I try and follow my calendar to the T. And that has been life changing. In nice. do, do you set up a calendar one day in advance or something? Or how do you? Typically, typically yes. In the uh, morning, I will review my calendar. But yeah. at the end of work week, I am looking at the whole week calendar yeah. and I'm blocking off time. I'm blocking off chunks of time. Uh, if you're not protective of your time, yeah. everyone will start sending out meeting requests and then all you're doing exactly. is jumping from one meeting to another. So I'll block off time for, okay, I want to think about this or I want to write down strategy or uh, I want to work with a PM for the next six months operating plan and so on. So I will force myself to block off time and then that time is not available for anyone else. Nice. My nice. measure of success is, did I do it at the time or not? Nice. Do you also put personal stuff on the calendar? Say you had to like lunch time, workout time, uh, shopping, anything like, do you also calendar those stuff? I mean, that has now kind of become a routine. So I try and definitely work out four or five times a week. Nice. Nice. Um, so I try to have a routine where I don't have to decide on the morning. Ki aaj kya karna hai? What do I need right. to do today? So uh, Saturday, Sunday is badminton. Uh, Monday is rest day. Tuesday and Thursday, I'll go for a run. So it's easy. It's become a ritual. It's automatic. Right. I don't have to decide. So that lowers the friction in your head, I think. So you wake up and, and you just automatically fall into your routine. So rituals are the other thing which is power, powerful. Uh, once it becomes part of your identity, once it becomes part of who you are as a yeah. person, it becomes very easy to execute. Motivation yeah, more... is overrated. Uh, you rise or fall to the level of the systems you have set up for yourself. Yes, 100% agree. Agree. I think it reduces that entire cognitive bias of making a decision every time, right? Once that yeah. is set, then uh, you can spend that much energy and time on the other stuff. Um, yeah. Completely agree. I think Ashwin, we spoke a bunch of times around sustainability. And I think we really, really appreciate what you do for the community in trying to, you know, reduce the garbage footprint. And we also did read an article that's come about in the Hindu about how you've been growing this tribe. Uh, for busy individuals, any tactical tips that you would like to share on how we can reduce our uh, garbage slash carbon uh, footprint uh, on a personal level and then maybe at a community level? Yeah, sure. I mean, so uh, in 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 uh, in Chennai, we kind of managed to convince 5,000 homes wow. to become zero waste homes. So we reduced their garbage footprint. Uh, we were avoiding about 500 tons of uh, stuff going to the landfill. So that was fun. Um, but very easy. Again, systems is what matters. Uh, can you segregate at source? In Bangalore, anyway, it is mandatory. So that's easy. Uh, it's yeah. becoming more and more. It's also mandated by law in most cities now. So segregate your wet waste and dry waste uh, and reject waste at source. Compost in your backyard or balcony. Uh, so go from Mimbi to Yimbi, which is not in my backyard to yes in my backyard. That's it. That's all you need to do. Uh, that will probably reduce 90% of your footprint. And the dry waste which you're putting out, which you're segregated is worth more to the circular economy workers and they can sell it uh, and, and they can earn, increase their living. Got in Chennai, we increased the uh, housekeeping staff of my community, their income by about 700 to 800 rupees a month. Wow. Because they had better cardboard, not, um, not wet with wet sambar uh, yeah. on it. Yeah. So people, they were getting a better price. And uh, that made a big difference to the community. Got it. Ashwin, one other challenge that I think I personally face is anything that you buy from the market, a lot of these things are packaged in not recyclable plastic, right? There's nothing I can do about it. Yes, segregation is great. But what do you do when, you know, right from bottles to suppose I buy a biscuit packet to anything, any consumable that you buy, uh, some of the packaging that comes through, like polythene bags, yes, I know we can at least carry around bags, but inevitably, um, bottles, bags, etc., that come in plastic, and I think plastic is one of the more dangerous aspects to environment. Right? Any have you have you found a way to deal with this? Yeah. See, I mean, it is better to be eighty percent eco 
Yeah. Versus then... say, hey, I can't be hundred, therefore I will be zero. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so a lot of people don't start because they will object to, अरे इस ये इसका कर नहीं सकते कुछ भी. I cannot right. do anything about this. Right. But start with handling your wet waste. Make it into compost. Uh, yeah. You can grow amazing veggies at home. Uh, plants at home, and uh, it's it's great fertilizer for the plants. How how easy is it to do that bit at home, like growing compost? Yeah, fairly, very fairly. very easy. Very easy. Two minutes of your day every day. Oh wow! Okay. Not even two minutes. Not even two oh. minutes. If you can train your domestic help, they will do it. Uh, okay. And, and so set up systems, right? And in balconies, all you need is one square foot of your space. Okay. Space. If you follow Shark Tank, uh, there was recently this lady Poonam Bir Kasturi. Uh-huh. Uh, right, was on Shark Tank. Dailydump. dot org uh, is yeah. the is is the website. Exactly. Runs. You can buy products there, which helps you compost it. Got it. Got it. No, thanks for sharing that. Um, Ashwin, uh, one last topic on this section that we'd love to discuss is uh, what is your thoughts on financial freedom? Is this something you've ever thought about? Is there a plan to achieve a certain number, um, or do you plan to work for like how how do you look at financial freedom? um is there a particular number that you have in mind or like you mentioned is there a process or a system to it yeah i yeah, know absolutely i i believe in systems uh and i truly believe motivation is overrated right so um early on again i mean uh, don't underestimate the power of compounding uh but at the same time you need to have the right balance so i used to aggressively save um uh, and uh, some of my family was sometimes frustrated about <laughs> the level of aggression of my savings um so you have to strike the right balance but save first and then spend later is a, is a good mantra to follow uh but also strike the right balance because when you are 40 when you are 50 when you are 60 you don't want to be left with regret are yaar i should have done that when i was 30 or 35 i should have invested in that experience and so on right so but life and business has ups and downs um so you have to plan for the downs while you are on the up so always save for a rainy day uh, even though you might feel like there will never be a rainy day it will inevitably occur uh, so good to have some plans and to consistently save develop consistent saving habits and that will stand you in in good stead okay. uh financial freedom for me is kind of time freedom uh, where i can kind of do what i want i don't have to think about uh spending money for my passions uh that is financial freedom but i love working and uh, i kind of love interacting with people love uh, making a difference love solving challenges uh, so yeah it's it's you you have to figure out what is right for you uh, good is there a formula is there some way that people like is there a tactical way to get to you know hey this is how i can get to financial freedom uh, a good formula warren warren buffett Uh, advises this is multiply everything you want to purchase by 200 because that is the eventual cost in terms of your wealth uh, when you purchase something so and wealthy and rich are two different things if yeah. you have something expensive you are actually less wealthy because it's now left your bank account uh, right. right the money is left your bank account to purchase this but again at the same time i come back to this theme of balance you have to enjoy your life you have to live your life as well and so the uh, striking the right balance uh, working to fulfill your family's aspirations once you get married your partner will have a slightly different views on life and and being able to come to the kind of uh, achieve the right middle ground is 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 crucial to kind of live a live a happy life and, got it feel got happy it. and fulfilled life got it No, thanks for sharing that. Uh, Ashwin, we come to the last section of today's discussion. Um, this one's around your product career fit, which is where we talk a little bit about leadership and the myths around product. Um, when we spoke to Yashwan, apparently one thing that they really mentioned is uh, while setting up teams, they feel that you know you've given them the right amount of freedom while also coming in. Uh, as a principal manager and providing support whenever necessary uh, do you have some leadership mantras that have really helped you um, is there some learnings over time that you've been able to imbibe that you think might be uh, very very useful for other senior folks tuning in yeah sure i mean again like i mentioned 
you want to hire smart people and as a leader your job is to create the ecosystem and get out of the way right let them execute uh, because if you are creating lots of processes that's a tax on that they have to pay uh, and it removes ownership because imagine something did not perform as well and if i ask you you'll say hey i did what you asked me to right so you want to push down decision making you want to enable people at the most junior level um, to mid levels to feel empowered to take decisions and move forward you align at the top on hey what are we trying to achieve align at the vision align and be stubborn on that and then you set up some mechanisms uh, i always tell my team good intentions don't scale everyone has good intentions so what mechanisms are you setting up uh, to kind of uh make things repeatable we for example have one some month uh, product health reviews where every product manager has to write a three to four page document on key performance indicators uh, metrics our leading indicators or input metrics like we call them and how did we how did we do any lessons learned any failures any outages what did we learn from that uh etc so i think the simplest lesson is for leaders avoid the temptation to uh over orchestrate over organize everything everyone is different so you have to allow different styles to take over and and uh run the show they want to uh ask for some minimal rituals which is repeatable which forces kind of them to reflect like for example the ritual we have once a month you have to publish results you have to talk about what impact did you expect what impact did you deliver um and enable high judgment individuals to take decisions and and run on their own because otherwise i am becoming the bottleneck i can only take a few decisions in a day i can only be in in certain places at a, in a day uh you you have to allow a thousand flowers to bloom right and and then you are also self selecting smart people who who will want to work in that empowered manner smart people who value uh freedom who value the ownership that is given to them who also value um uh, feeling empowered who value that feeling of oh it's ambiguity it's it's ambiguous i have to figure this out yeah uh, some people will will not thrive in that environment they'll, they'll struggle and those are the people you are then kind of self selecting out of the officer right so yeah like i mean there is a great story right steve jobs he was asked what is your job as ceo he said preventing bozos from joining apple bozo prevention is his job that that was his answer but nice. i think that energy holds yeah yeah no appreciate really appreciate you being there and you know sharing this with us um, <coughs> ashwin last question for you um what's one thing that you wish people really understood more about product management you shared with us earlier how you know product management wasn't even a thing like when you got started 2006 mein you were still doing a lot of stuff that today product managers do but um, today we are on the other end of the spectrum i feel where everyone wants to get into product management what is a good reality check for that um the need to iterate so be comfortable with your version 0 of course i mean you have to have excuse me uh, good instincts and prioritize the right stuff to do um once you have the right philosophy the right mental models uh once you build that feature or product um all i mean once you actually are in market and you encounter customers you will be surprised a thousand different ways um uh, and i i learned this even when i was kind of uh convincing my community to do composting right i mean our iteration zero was tell everyone to put a uh, um um put a compost bin in their balconies then there was quality control issues people were complaining they didn't do it right so i had i was having to go and explain to everyone it was not scalable then iteration 1 we put segregated bins in the in in the parking lot again quality control issues someone will come screw it up they'll put wet waste into the driveway bin and so on so iteration 2 was okay whom can i teach and ensure quality control there is 12 housekeeping staff so we will teach them and we will get them to go uh, house to house door to door and collect garbage uh, 
um and so that was that was the one which then was successful we then kind of gave them those ice cream bells then so to, we wanted to create anticipation and we wanted to create a routine um and then uh i and and even then some people would complain ki oh this time people are coming my baby is sleeping at this time someone is ringing the bell loudly etc but so you have to continuously keep your feet to the ground uh, ear to the ground listen for feedback and be willing to iterate there is no such thing as i mean there there might be for people like steve jobs and so on there is a brilliant insight and then they go and build it uh, but very rarely does that happen you have to be willing to persevere you have to be willing to iterate and the organization also has to be willing and give the product team that comfort that we will iterate and we will figure things out uh, the one big failure mode for pms is they feel like i need to figure everything out you don't the organization needs to figure it figure it out you have to ask the right questions and for that that comes from clarity of thinking and uh, being close to the customers and understanding their behaviors and and then having thick skin i have had uh, i have my wife has gotten threats <coughs> when we were rolling out this composting saying hey something is not right i'm getting a bad smell i'm going to kind of uh, get get your husband beaten if this he doesn't stop this and so on so you learn to get comfortable with that and when you believe in the right cause and if you do it right once the system is there once people see the rewards now there is there is a barter system with nurseries for the compost that we give out they get uh, we, we get plants back now everyone is uh, kind of talking about it on social media sharing it etc we, we did lots of social proofing stuff as well uh, like we whoever was composting we would stick a sticker on their door saying hey i am proud i don't trash my city i compost i segregate at home and we were kind of creating uh, social proofing and so on but again long winded way of saying be thick skinned and be willing to be misunderstood for long periods of time is a superpower if you give up at the first instance of trouble then you're 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 gone right and and it was uh, i look back to those days it was stressful for sure my wife was like why why are you willing to go through this but it is worth it in in the end and there's a lot of satisfaction you derive and uh, when people see the end results then there is now a self self uh, uh, there is a self propagating propagation of energy right and now more and more people are kind of getting into it and and so on so it's, it's worth it in the end you you're on mute i've lost you yeah 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 so sorry, sorry yeah i was just i was just saying that i think if you believe in the cause and um, in the early days it is going to be hard like you said but if you can just get through those early days where like you mentioned being misunderstood then i think there will be a time and when people can see the results when they see the that is where you need to get to that stage it often can take you know 6 12 months to get there you need to get through that phase and i think then things become a little easier yeah but that's where then small wins are super important yeah. especially when you are in a setting where people are critical ye kyun kar rahe hain this is a waste of time i have had people challenging saying i am having to segregate after i am ready for work Uh, I will not segregate. You come and segregate in my house. I will not touch <laughs> it. I said five minutes ago it was put in your hand. Yeah. Now once it's gone into the bin, uh, why can't you just put it into two bins, right? So you have to be willing to be patient, but showing some small wins, quick wins, which develops belief, is also important. It it nice. gives you some reinforcement, but it also gives the organization reinforcement, saying, "Oh, okay, we are on on to something here." Uh, so it's all about balance. You, nice. If you take too long, your product might get killed. Sure. uh small wins and then iterate once you have the kernel of an idea you have to keep iterating until you get absolutely, it absolutely right. absolutely ashwin thanks so much for sharing this other i think i personally learned a lot from today's discussion uh it was a good long chat i think um, but uh, ranged all the way from cricket and rahul dravid to product management principles and then a lot and lot more on the personal side so once again thanks so much for joining us today uh fantastic fantastic for and yes looking forward to you know seeing your journey at incred progress as well and hopefully um you know maybe host you on the next season and see how that progresses as well thank you for having me and uh, thanks for listening to me for for a close to an hour so appreciate it thanks ashwin